Would you please stand as we sing our hymn of the month?
Will you join me in prayer? Our loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we do come before you this morning, shouting our praises unto you, O Lord, our life and our salvation. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather in this house, the opportunity to worship you as we please, and Father, to honor you and glorify you in each and everything that we do. Father, I pray for those that are here today that you'll open their hearts and their minds to your word, Father, that their hearts may be touched, their lives be blessed, and may your kingdom be glorified. For we give you thanks in your son's name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. And yes, I'm not Lewis Penfield. <laughs> I am Charlie Gibson. Now, I just want to say a word of welcome to those of you that are with us here today. We're glad you're here. If you're visiting with us, in front of you, in the pew in front of you, there's a little card there. If you'll fill that out and put it in the offertory plate when it comes by, uh, we certainly would appreciate that. And it gives, give us a record of your being here. And if there's anything that we can do as a church family to help you, we want to take care of that and we want to do that. If you're visiting with us by way of radio or TV, we want to welcome you to our services today also. And if there's ever an opportunity that you want to visit with us here at church, if you'll call the office at 359-4077, we'll be glad to come by and pick you up, and we'll be certainly more than welcome to take you home, too. But we're just glad that you're visiting with us today, and we're glad you're here, and let's just take the opportunity to stand and greet each other at this time. What 
morning, good morning. We still got a little bit more room up here if anybody else wants to come up. This morning, I want to talk to you guys about something real special. I want to talk to you about love. Now, I'm not talking about mushy love. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the love in our hearts, the love that we as Christians should have. Now, I heard this story about some children in Africa. Now, I brought a picture of them. It's not a very good picture because my printer's running out of color. But look at them. Aren't they sweet? All these little children. And guess what? They're little children just like you guys. Just like you guys. And there was a scientist, and he went over here to Africa to, to live with these people for several months and study their lives and, and their traditions and what they do. And he was getting ready to leave and come back to the United States and write a book about what all he had found out. And he thought, i got a little bit of time before I have to get to the airport. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something special for them because these kids didn't have a whole lot. So he went and he purchased this giant basket of fruit. And he sat it out over under a tree and he called all the children together and he told them he was leaving and he wanted to do something special for them so they're going to have a race. He said, when I say go, I want you all to run over there to that basket of fruit. And the first one that gets there gets the basket of fruit, okay? And they all shook their little heads. And Then he said, okay, on your marks, get set. Go. And you know what those kids did? They took each other's hands and they ran as one. And they all got to that basket of fruit at the same time. And then they shared it. And he just stopped and stood there. He goes, why did you guys do that? Any one of you could have had that whole foot basket of fruit for yourself. <laughs> and one little bitty girl, probably one of the smallest ones there, looked at him and said, how could we all be happy if we got it and everybody else was sad because they didn't get it. We couldn't enjoy it. Well, that's a picture of what love really looks like. How can we be really happy as Christians if we get all of that fruit that God's given us, all that love that he's given us, and nobody else has it? We have to share it. The Bible has some things to say about love. Now, I won't read the whole thing to you, but there's a couple of spots in it you need to hear. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy and it does not boast. It's not proud, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, keeps no records of wrongs. Love doesn't delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. And then in the final verse it says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So as you go out and about and you're doing what you do every day, going to school, coming to church, just remember that love's not really doing any good if you keep it all to yourself. You've got to go out and share it, just like Christ shares his love with us. Okay, let's say our prayers. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we just praise you for the for the gift of grace and the gift of love that you so richly pour out on us, Lord. Just, just allow each and every one of us to remember that that love doesn't do any good just bottled up inside us, Lord. We've got to share it with all those around us to truly experience that love. We ask you to watch over us and keep us safe, Lord. We ask it in your blessed name. I must tell you that the, uh, the joyful worship that we've experienced this morning is just right for the, for the day and for all of us. Um, underlying the great joy that we've expressed in our worship this morning is a kind of a sadness, sorrow. This, this has been a rough period of time for our church, hasn't it? I mean, stop and think about it. There's, there's an intensity with which we're greeting um, the illnesses, the sorrows that some of our members are feeling. Uh, for me, it was a two-funeral week, and so two families that I was aware of grieving uh, a great loss. I got the word this week that Kim, fourth diagnosis of cancer, caught all of us off guard, didn't it? Kind of got to us. Been concerned about Freddie, bravely struggling and 
suffering with ALS. I haven't spoken much about my mother and my father and uh, what's going on in their life. And, and then to speak of Wes and what's happening with him um, uh, and Jackie. Recovering from a concussion, you may not have known that. Thinking about David and Cindy Johnson and Tommy and Sandra Wynn, who are agonizing over things happening in the lives of their grandchildren. And a uh, growing number of men in our congregation who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer. We're hearing a lot of painful, hurtful kinds of, kinds of things. I was talking with Hazel the other day, and she was telling me about 40 years ago when she had cancer, and she said, not a day comes that I don't think about it. I saw Brandon in the, in the balcony. He's probably not supposed to, you're probably not supposed to know he's up there because he can't be around people that much right now. But, you know, think of Brandon, you think of leukemia. You think of a uh, whole host of other names that have come to our attention with, with leukemia. It's hard to say it, isn't it? I mean, it's just very, very painful. Um, we're an aging congregation. There are some folk not with us today because they're home and would be here but cannot. Every year at the annual uh, New Duck River Baptist Association meeting when they have a prayer, a memorial prayer, we have the longest list of names of all the churches in our association. And that's, that's just the chaplaincy part of the, of the work that that we talk about here. There's a tension between caring for one another and, and loving one another and supporting one another and being with each other in, in those difficult times. But the tension is with the mission of the church, the outreach of the church, a community of people all around us. I thought, I've been in crowded places and, and just had the, the awareness maybe that, that um, most of the people that are in that crowd may not know Christ. And you know what the end of life is for those who do not know Christ. And there's so much for us, all of us. It takes all of us to do that work. <coughs> in short, I'm glad we had joyful worship this morning because it sort of takes the edge off of the feeling of overwhelming I don't know, just feeling overwhelmed that, um, that many of us have. And having that growing sense this week, I thought we need to pray. We need to, we need to pray in a certain kind of way. Psalm 130, verses 1 through 8, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More than the watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let's join together and pray. Our Father, we are grateful that you call us into your presence, that you invite us to come before you, to be bold and daring in, in offering up to you the concerns of our hearts, the burdens that we carry, the joys that we experience, to give you praise and thanks for being with us in every circumstance in life. And this is a day, this is a time that we pray restore us, O oh God, our Father. Cause us to return to you. 
take us back, draw us into deep intimacy with our Abba Father. Bring us to the ground of our salvation, to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, to the always newness of our life in Jesus, to the many promises in your word, to the joy and peace of being with you, to where your grace is sufficient for us because of how much we're dealing with. We gather before you with aching bodies broken hearts, crushed spirits, with longing for a future, with a desire to overcome our pain and sorrow, to be free from anxiety and fear, to arrest the confusion and uncertainty, to find help and healing. What a great word, healing. We all desire it for ourselves, for other people around us. We need it. And it comes from you. It is your gift of grace that serves your purpose, that accomplishes your will, that declares your glory, that reveals your goodness. It's what we long for what we all will experience if not here then when you make all things new when you bring to completion what you began in Christ we pray that you would help us realize dreams founded by your word that you would enable us to finish our race strong, that you would sustain us in our old age, that we may see the faith take hold of our children and flourish in our children's children, that we may have a legacy formed and shaped by your abundant grace. We bow before you broken, but hopeful, sorrowful, but full of joy, and grateful to the God who loved us and sent Jesus for us. And we dare to pray in the strong name of him who died on a cross in our place, the name of Jesus. We stand.
Will you join me again in prayer? <clears throat> Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, it is a sweet, sweet spirit in this place today as we have come to worship you, to adore you, to lift our lives before you. Father, we just pray that you'll be with us, that you will guide our actions. Father, that as we give back a portion of that that you've so abundantly given to us, may we do it so, Father, with a loving spirit. And Father, we just lift up this nation, the people who serve, those around us in our community, those here at this church, that all may feel your love, and we all worship in your presence. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen.
My father-in-law is an interesting fellow in a lot of different ways. He has some skills that I wish I had. I wish uh, uh, he found several old pieces of furniture that were uh, that had been kind of put in a place unexpected in a barn and had been left there for a long time. They were pieces of furniture that he was familiar with from uh, his uh, aunt and uncle from when he was a child, and he had these uh, these pieces of furniture that had been stored, not really stored, kind of left exposed. Uh, in this barn for a very long time so that they were no longer recognizable. And, you know, even though there was a little bit of sentimental attachment that members of this family had for these pieces of, of furniture, they, they just didn't think that they were worth anything. But, but Papa saw, he saw more than the sentimental value. He saw something in these pieces of wood that, that he could do. He took this old... Um, a sideboard, you know, great big chest that used to sit in their uh, dining area, and um, and somebody had cut the legs off, you know, and just destroyed the piece of furniture. And he cut the legs off and and left it sitting out there in the barn, and it just was so dilapidated and and terrible. But Papa took it home, and and with a little TLC, he he put legs on that thing, and you have to look very very closely to see the seam, to see how that happened. He did so much just working with that wood that it, it looks better than it did when it was first manufactured. That, that's what restoration does. It does something, it makes something better than it ever was before. It takes it to a level beyond what it was. And, and where all the family didn't care for that when it was dilapidated, now they saw it and they all wanted it. He said, no way. <laughs> Jesus is involved in a massive project of restoration. It, it's, it's an ongoing process that he is unfolding in our, in our midst. It, it involves the whole universe, actually. It focuses on the earth. I mean, God's special attention, as far as we know, is on this earth, and it includes all of humanity, but it gets even better than that. It targets every one of you. Everyone in this place is the object of this restoration project that the Lord is dealing, uh, doing right now. The story that the Bible tells is sandwiched between descriptions of creation. You may not have noticed that, but, but if you look at Genesis 1-1, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and you have, you have the heavens and the earth are created. They begin, they have a beginning, they, and, and you know, there's some substance, and now this is the beginning of, of, of history. This is the beginning, a, a, a kind of beginning that when you get to Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, John saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first 
heaven and the first earth had passed away. Well, now, it doesn't take a whiz kid to figure out that somewhere between the first heaven and earth and the second heaven and earth, something has gone dreadfully wrong. And that's the reason for the, for the restoration project that the Lord is up to. The, the, the new heavens and earth are going to show God's original intention, God's original purpose, God, uh, God putting his signature on his creation, and, and uh, uh, there'll be a, a beauty and a harmony that, uh, that we have never known. We, we, we will never know what the first creation was all about. Uh, the, the new heavens and new earth will be an unaffected paradise, now, unaffected by anything that we know uh, that devastates the world that we, we live in, a place that will be suitable. Suitable is not a good word, um, but I'll use it. Suitable, appropriate, the right place for God and his people to be together forever. That's not this earth, right? That's the reason for this restoration. We've, we've never known the first. We do not yet know the second. We're living in the middle. We're living in the, in the time of restoration, in, a, in, a, in the midst of the project that's going on. And it's good news for all of us. It's good news for all of us because, because we're all in need of what this restoration project promises for us. We God is giving life to his fallen creatures. God is giving meaning and purpose and hope to people like you and me. Not all of us are going to receive that. That's the sadness of this restoration project. It will not reach everybody that you know. God is calling his redeemed to come back to come back to him, to return to him, to get involved in this project again. Because most of us in this place can look back to a time and to a place when we heard the word of truth, when we believed the gospel of our salvation, and in some very personal, deeply, profoundly personal way, we trusted in Christ and the Spirit of God came to inhabit us, and we began to live what the Bible calls eternal life. We have eternal life right here, right now. It's not waiting for us to come. It's here and now. And what we've done with that life is the reason that we all, in this place, need restoration. We need to be rebuilt. Renewed. The man that needed to attend a, an important meeting. Um, and so he had to get up a little bit early and, and, and he didn't realize uh, until he ran out the door that it had rained the night before, but he ran out the door to try to make his, his meeting and he had to catch the 805 train into the city to do that. And right outside the door, his son was sitting there playing in the mud just having a big time in the mud. He was rubbing it all over his face and getting it all over his clothes, and he was wallering in the mud, he, you know, if he was, could have been a little piggy. I, I, thought of, I thought of that character, you kids probably don't know, Charlie Brown, the cartoon uh, strip, uh, Pigpen, you know Pigpen? Everywhere Pigpen goes, a little cloud of stuff follows him, you know, that's that, that's kind of way life is for all of us, you know. And so, so the dad, he's trying to get around the boy who's playing in the mud and having a big time and thinking to himself, boy, I wish I could stay here and play in the mud with my son. And he stumbled and he, he fell in the mud. And he's got this meeting to go to. He's got to catch the 805 and barely enough time to get there. And he's, he's got to go to this meeting and, boy, I'd like to stay here and play in the mud but got this meeting, you know, so he's got that tension going on, and he's really struggling with this thing, and um, he decides, he says, now, on the 805, there's going to be a restroom where I can go and clean up and get ready for my meeting, so rather than rushing back into the house and trying to clean up, he heads for the 805, and he's going to take advantage of 
and empty restrooms where he can, where he can get ready for the meeting, where he can kind of get some of the muck and the mire off of him that he's, he's fallen into. Well, there are two kinds of people in this place today. Two kinds of people. Um, some of you don't have any place to go. <laughs> You, you, there's, there's nothing pressing on you to get you to go anywhere, and, and, uh, and you're just happy playing in the mud. You know, there's n- nothing you want to do. You're just happy playing in the mud, you know. It, it's a metaphor in case you're wondering, okay? <laughs> you're just happy playing in the mud. Just let your mind wrestle with that. Uh, uh, you know, you're, you're your own pig pen. You know, you're just, just happy to be that way. It's, it's funny, and it's sad. At the same time, funny and sad that how some people can be so self-righteous and self-satisfied about their mud hole. You know, this is my mud hole. Isn't it a good one? Yeah. I'm just going to hang out in the mud hole. Um, now, the other kind of person is some of us, you know, we know we're in the mud hole, but we don't want to be there. You know, and, and so... Uh, we're trying to think of ways to get out of the mud hole and, and trying to use all the opportunities that are there for us, especially the grace opportunities there for us to get out of the mud hole. That's, that's what we need to do. Maybe, maybe you've slipped in the mud. Maybe you've wallowed in the mud for a long time. Maybe you're just coming to the realization that being in the mud hole is not such a good thing. And maybe you just need to take advantage of an opportunity to go someplace else, to catch the train, to catch the gospel train that'll take you to the place where you really want to be, take you home, take you back where God would love you to be. I've been reading in the Gospels and other places, and I'm taken with the fact that when Jesus was preparing his disciples for his death, he talked with one of the guys who didn't know where he was going. Jesus said, you know, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I prepare a place for you, I'll come and take you to myself, and you know the way. And one of the disciples said, we don't know the way. And, and Jesus would say, I, uh, I'm a, myself in the way and the truth and the life. And he said, He wanted that disciple in particular to know that when he comes for us, it's after he prepares the place for us, it's because he wants us to be with him forever. Always to be with him. And a couple of chapters, that's John chapter 14, in case you're wondering. A couple of chapters later, John chapter 17, Jesus is praying, and he prays for the same guys, the same disciples, and for all of of us, And he prays, Father, show them my glory, which you gave me. Something in the message of the gospel, always about God's glory. Everything that God does is for his glory. He loves us for his glory. He works salvation for his glory. My salvation, your salvation is for his glory. That's what it's all about. He said, Jesus prayed, show them my glory, which you gave me. And then he added, so that they may be glorious and be with us forever. Has it, has it astounded you that the reason behind your salvation is just this? God wants you to be with him forever. That's the delight of the gospel. That's the wonder of the of the gospel, and so he calls you out of your mud hole. Come, my place is clean. My place is pleasant. My place is truly satisfying. Relationship with me, God says, will be more than you could ever imagine. Wonderful. Come, live in my place. An Old Testament saint named David. Everybody's heard of David. Anybody here not heard of David? Okay. Everybody's heard of David. David 
David realized he was in the mud hole. So he prayed. When you're in the mud hole, that's what you need to do, right? He prayed, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. You see, the, the root cause of all the trauma and the misery and the heartache and the sin and the, and, the, and the suffering that we do and the sickness that is a part of life goes back to the fall and because of our personal individual participation in the fall. Original sin is the controlling factor, the controlling dynamic that covers all of life for us right now, we would be crazy if we denied that. And even crazier if we deny that any personal responsibility or participation in what the fall is all about. So whenever David found himself in trouble, he realized that sometimes things happen to us, we don't cause them. But in nearly every circumstance, in, I said nearly, I scratched that word, not nearly, in every circumstance, there is some sin responsibility. There's been something about it that we did wrongly. And so David would confess. He would confess and cry out to God and ask, take me out of the mud hole. Or better yet, take the mud hole out of me. That's what he did. The Apostle John writes, If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Let that one wash over you just a minute. If we say we do not have sin... We're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, how many sinners are in the place today? Raise your hand. Thank you for that confession. John goes on to write, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's not just bad news that all of us have sin. It's good news that in acknowledging the sin, there's forgiveness and cleansing. How many clean sinners are there in the place today? Some of you are reluctant to raise your hands. I'm not going to dispute it. Even the worst one among you can be a cleansed sinner just by acknowledging the fact of your sin. That's what John writes. That's what he wants us to know. I mean, you may still want to stay in your mud hole, but you can still be a clean sinner, okay? And if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. That's a, that's a great word. It puts us all on equal ground, doesn't it? We're all, we're all in the same boat, aren't we? All of us, all of us sinners, all of us sinners who are now the object of a special love that God has. And and we're like part of that restoration project that God's working on, getting us ready to live in his place. Now, you've had this experience before. I'm going to change my metaphor now. Um, so I just want to alert you to, I'm changing the metaphor now. Um, um, you're driving along. Guys, you never had this problem. You never drove a long distance before realizing you're going the wrong way. Right? You told your wife when she said, Stop and ask somebody. You said, I know where I'm going. Right? Okay. You're going the wrong way. You're 20 miles, 20 miles out of your way, 
20 miles out of your way and at full speed. You're headed that way. And you realize you've gone the wrong way. What do you do? Well, right up there, not very far, it's going to be an off-ramp, right? You'll take that off-ramp, and there'll be a bridge over the interstate, and you'll drive across that bridge, and on the other side, there'll be an on-ramp, right? You just take the off-ramp, cross the bridge, get on the on-ramp, you'll be headed in the right direction, right? Well, let's, let's put spiritual terms attached to that. The, the off-ramp is the ramp of confession, okay? You have to say, I'm going the wrong way, right? That's confession, all right? And then the overpass, the overpass, the little bridge, we'll call that grace. That's, that's the way that you get from going the wrong way to get to where you can go the right way. Grace, that's what that's all about. And uh, the on-ramp. It gets you going in the right direction again. That's the, that's the on-ramp of restoration. Now, you, know, you may think, okay, okay, you make that little maneuver. The, off, the off-ramp of confession, the uh, overpass of grace, and the on-ramp of restoration, and you're thinking, I'm still 20 miles out of my way. And some people feel bad about that. And Some people, when they get to the realization that they're just going the wrong way, they'll say, I've gone so far, I'm just going to keep on going. (laughs) But if you've you've crossed that bridge, if you've turned around and you're going, and you're still a long way from where you need to be, just be patient. Just be patient. You've been that way before. It won't seem as long as you take your time getting back where you need to be. Be patient. You're making progress on your journey now. You're going where you're supposed to go, where you want to go, where you need to go. So just just remember, repentance and restoration is bridged by grace. The way to get in the right direction, the crossover. Something change this something normal into something.